Okay, awesome. Uh, thank you so much for coming to my uh, tea talk today. I will be talking to you about how we can use some of the recent advancements in graph representation learning to support and reinforce uh, algorithmic reasoning style tasks and how these might benefit our uh, neural network architectures uh, in the long run. So when I think of approaches to solving problems in general, I usually think of them as partitioned into two directions. Either we have this sort of uh, rigorous, hard-coded way to tackle the particular problem, which takes into account some of the invariances in the problem explicitly, and um, works the same across different uh, input ranges. And this can often be formalized under the umbrella of classical algorithms. And on the other side, we have machine learning, which dynamically learns to adapt to specifics of the raw inputs to outputs mapping based uh, on the based just on the properties of the raw data without necessarily looking into the specifics of the task. And I've kind of here put neural networks as uh, an umbrella for machine learning, given that nowadays neural networks are used to reinforce almost every aspect of, uh, of machine learning uh, approaches. And these two approaches seem to be quite distinct and quite, um, quite varied in terms of uh, their strong points and weak points. In particular, uh, neural networks have the benefit of directly operating on raw data. That means we don't have to worry about processing the data in a particular way before feeding it into the, into the model. Uh, they perform quite well at generalizing to noisy um, conditions. And the models that we get, the specific neural net models that we create, can often be reusable across tasks, meaning that if we have a good convolutional net architecture that works on some kind of image classification task, we can usually reuse a very similar architecture, like reuse a lot of ideas when trying to do a completely different image classification task. The downsides of neural nets is that they often require big data to generalize properly, and uh, they get quite unreliable when you extrapolate, even when you go a little bit out of distribution, but even worse so when you go to inputs that are of larger sizes than the ones you've been trained on, the predictions of neural networks usually get quite unreliable and uncertain. And uh, kind of in line with that, once you have a top performing neural network, it's often quite hard to reason about why it made the decisions it made and why it decided to act the way it did. So interpretability is also a big issue with neural nets. Algorithms, classical algorithms seem to almost fall on the opposite side of the spectrum in that once you write out an algorithm, it will usually strongly generalize trivially. If you feed in an input that's two or three times as big as the inputs you inspected when you came up with the algorithm, the algorithm will work seamlessly on them as well. And this is uh, in line with the fact that algorithms can have very interpretable stepwise operations, and you can usually prove or guarantee their correctness or a certain approximation ratio through rigorous theory or uh, formal verification methods. And uh, Another good property of algorithms is that they are, uh, in a sense, very compositional because you can construct algorithms out of a bunch of these pre-cooked subroutines from, from a cookbook that you can then assemble and build new algorithms based on parts of previous ones. So in a way, they support a lot of the parts that neural networks tend to struggle with. But then on the flip side, in order, to, in order for an algorithm to be effective for the problem you have, you must be able to cast the inputs to your problem into the specification and preconditions that the algorithm requires. Otherwise, there's it's literally anybody's guess what the algorithm would do to them. And they're really not that robust to task variations. If I give you the task of recognizing something completely different than what the original algorithm was designed for, usually you have to go back to the drawing board and reinvent an entirely new algorithm. So you lose this uh, sense of uh, reusability of a particular uh, structure across different kinds of tasks. So if you can see these two, the strong points and the weak points, they seem to align quite well with each other. So if we were somehow able to get the best of both worlds and mitigate all the downsides, we could be well on our way towards creating a, a very strong general uh, learner. And uh, there has been quite some work in using neural networks to reinforce algorithms. That is typically using neural networks as an oracle or a heuristic of some sort inside an algorithm. But in this talk, I will primarily focus on the other direction, which has recently seen quite some attention. That is 
to what extent can we reuse ideas or pipelines that are present in classical algorithms and use them to reinforce the decision making that neural networks do? So the main question that I seek to answer in this talk is, can neural networks robustly reason like algorithms? Are there aspects of algorithmic reasoning that we can incorporate in neural nets? And if you look at what algorithms do in general, you give them some kind of uh, ordered or unordered set of objects and potentially some relations between them. And then the algorithm just does a bunch of manipulations over these objects and computes the final result that you care about. Since we have objects and relations, algorithms basically operate over some sort of graph specified over parts of your input. And this means that graph neural nets can be quite relevant and quite applicable to tackling these kinds of problems. So what we are going to do here is supervise graph neural networks with their message passing mechanisms to perform algorithmic execution. And here I've given just one high-level example of what we mean here, the bread-first search algorithm that computes uh, shortest paths in an unweighted graph. Initially, we have a tagged source vertex with a distance of 0, and all other vertices don't have a defined distance. It's infinity. And then we supervise a graph neural network, which performs iterative steps of uh, message passing in latent space, where each node receives and exchanges features with its neighborhood. And as a result, at the output level, we should get for each vertex the distance it has to the source and some reconstruction potentially of the shortest path tree, which tells us which edges are used to get to the source most efficiently. And this approach, this general approach of using a GNN to model outputs of algorithms directly from raw inputs is what I will call neural graph algorithm execution. And it's the central topic of the works that will be explored here. Now, I often get asked the question, why are we doing this? Because if you're going to model outputs of classical algorithms, especially if they're polynomial time algorithms, why not just go ahead and execute the algorithm? Why do you need this extra modeling neural network step in the middle? And I had to think long and hard about this, and I've came up with four uh, larger directions, roughly ordered in uh, how uh, short term they are, like how quickly usable they're going to be. And these four directions are we can use this to get better benchmarks for graph neural nets. Using this kind of training mode, we can reinforce strong generalization in our models. There's actually an untapped, previously untapped, and unexplored potential for multitask learning in this setting. And ultimately, when we leverage uh, all three of the previous ones, we could even use it to discover novel, novel algorithms in some circumstances. So I will start with the most obvious one, the benchmarking uh, aspect. And there is a big problem in graph representation learning right now in that a lot of our benchmarks that we use to gauge the uh, strengths and weaknesses of different graph neural net models are very unreliable. And I've here just highlighted two papers that tackle this issue for node classification and graph classification. Turns out that some of the most standard benchmarks we use, such as Cora and Sites here, are uh, basically like MNIST at this point. All the different graph models that we've proposed recently tend to perform more or less the same with only tiny insignificant variations. So these data sets are not that good for differentiating different ideas. Whereas in graph classification, the problem sometimes becomes even more complicated in that it's sometimes better to just ignore the graph structure altogether, and an MLP will perform better than a graph neural network in most circumstances. So clearly, these kinds of data sets that most papers use are not the way to go right now. And one hypothesis I have for why this happens in these data sets is that their uh, learning complexity is just not on a very high level. And I think the SGC paper that I've linked here, which uh, seeks to simplify graph convolutional networks to the simplest possible model, where they remove all activations from the model, and they just have uh, a classification like layer at the end. Everything else is linear. And they just do a bunch of feature aggregation across the vertices. And already, this very simple model where there's no deep learning involved whatsoever, but instead just like a classification layer detail, performs really well and sometimes even state of the art on many classical graph benchmarks. So this shows that the inputs or the relationships between them simply aren't that complex to require complicated deep learning architectures in the first place. So in this setting, learning how to imitate and execute algorithms can prove very favorable. 
first of all, because we're kind of simulating inputs and outputs to a given abstract function, we can, in principle, generate infinite amounts of data. And therefore, we don't have the problem of uh, potentially overfitting to certain specifics. And algorithms often require complex data manipulation. So generally, the more expressive the graph neural net model is, it's going to get better at modeling the underlying dynamics. And in all three papers that I will be discussing here, you can see a very clear hierarchy of different graph neural network models emerging when you task them with an algorithmic reasoning benchmark. So these are the figures from three papers that I'm going to cover today that uh, discuss and tackle different aspects of graph representation learning uh, over algorithmic reasoning tasks. And as you can see, just by looking at the plots, there are clear differences between various established graph neural network benchmarks, which would otherwise be indistinguishable in the more standard data sets. So this is hopefully one additional motivation for why these kinds of tasks would be a good idea, at least for diagnosing the different expressive powers of graph neural nets. And another sort of uh, uh, potentially over, overlooked benefit is that we have a clearly specified function that generates the data, which is the underlying algorithm. And this means that there usually is no noise in the data that our model can get confused by. And this means that we can rigorously assess to what extent can different GNN architectures reason about different parts of the of the algorithm and whether they're actually learning the underlying reasoning rule, meaning we can do rigorous credit assignment. Here I provide two plots from our iClear paper where um, we have trained the network to do a reachability task, which is you start from a source vertex, which has a value of one, and your job is to propagate that value of one to every other vertex reachable from the source. And this is a very simple task for any GNN to do, but also looking at the fact that most of our graphs are connected, you could get equally, almost equally good performance by just predicting everything is reachable. So most models can learn to cheat and just say, attach a one to everything. But with GNNs, we know this clear generating function, we can actually use some GNN visualization and explainability techniques to highlight which parts of the graph were most responsible for attaching a one to a particular vertex. And here we see for two particular input graphs, that it actually learns to highlight exactly the path from the source vertex to the destination. And it highlights the shortest possible way to get there. So it didn't just happen to attach a one to this vertex by chance. It actually learned to follow the shortest path and attach this meaning to the vertex. So having this clear generating function gives us a better way to do model diagnostics in general. And also, even though we're mostly going to be focused on polynomial time algorithms here that are efficient and therefore can be effectively simulated in this sense, this is still fine because most of the algorithms that we use practically, including heuristics for harder problems, are polynomial time algorithms themselves. However, I should note that most of the techniques discussed here will be applicable to MP hard problems as well. I've here highlighted just one paper from Chaitanya Joshi, uh, Thomas Laurent, and Xavier Besson which uh, looks at the traveling salesman problem in a similar way, trying to simulate uh, what the final output would be on some smaller instances and then seeing how well that generalizes to more complicated uh, TSP instances. So from a benchmarking point of view, there's a lot of benefits to doing things uh, with uh, algorithmic generated data sets. The second point is strong generalization. And what I like to highlight here is that when I say I want to learn an algorithm, it is distinctly different from saying I want to learn an input-output mapping. And here I have some figures from the neural Turing machine paper, which uh, learns to do this uh, copy task. So you have uh, inputs at the top, and the ground truth outputs are exactly the same as the inputs. Now, one might ask, like from an algorithmic point of view, this is kind of silly because learning to copy isn't necessarily like a very tricky algorithm at all. Like It's just take parts of your input and replicate them. However, if uh, a neural network has just learned how to do input-output mappings, it can learn to pick up on the subtleties or patterns or weird, uh, weird artifacts in the training data. And then when you try to extrapolate them to wider sequences, you can see that, in fact, they haven't quite learned how to do copying. Because here you have a few unseen test sequences, which are longer than the training sequences. And you have the model errors highlighted in different colors. So already, once the sequences get a little bit longer than the training distribution, the model will make a few mistakes. 
And by the time you spread them out to something that's, uh, I don't know, four times as long, the model will make quite a few mistakes. And therefore, you can see that it hasn't really learned how to do copying. It has just learned how to do an input-output copy mapping on sequences of a certain size. So it hasn't really learned an algorithm. It has just learned a way to circumvent the computations of the algorithm using some specifics of uh, training sequences at smaller ranges. However, if we have this sort of uh, algorithmic execution setup where we explicitly imitate individual steps of the algorithm, this can enable us to actually do strong generalization, which means no matter how big of an input I give you, I will still be able to robustly give you an answer. And this is kind of related to how humans devise algorithms by hand. So you might, on a whiteboard or in a notebook, write out a few small graphs and reason about what the algorithm should do to them. And the reasoning steps you've come up with will be equally applicable when you scale up to much larger uh, data sets. And here I've had uh, just a few figures that illustrate in one of the papers that I will cover today the sort of results they've been able to get with this kind of supervision. So they've only trained to do sorting and shortest paths on uh, inputs of up to eight objects. And when trained in a specific unit-wise way, they are able to get 100% accuracy even when they scale up to inputs of size 100, which is way beyond the, the range in which they were trained. And uh, uh, what can also interestingly emerge is that the representations of individual objects in the latent space can get quite interesting and generalizable in this sense. So on the right-hand side, you see representations from a neural network that was taught just to do binary addition. So add two binary numbers together and get a third one, which is a very important primitive for many algorithms. And you can see that it learns to structure its latent space such that successive uh, integers kind of follow this uh, bendy arrow pattern. And when you follow the arrow pattern, the numbers always increase by one. And this kind of data organization is critical to being able to generalize properly because when I'm faced with an unseen binary input, I know roughly where I need to map it in this space, and it kind of naturally generalizes. So what we do here is we're basically grounding the graph neural network in the underlying algorithmic reasoning rule. And if we say that all of deep learning is about learning abstract representations, in this setting, we're actually learning representations of manipulations. So we learn a representation of what it means to do an atomic change of the data, which, when composed sufficiently many times, will lead to a desirable ground truth output. So once we have this strong generalization concept narrowed down, we can see that it actually unlocks a lot of potential for multitask learning. Because if we're learning representations of manipulations, this means that there is a lot of potential for knowledge transfer and reuse that just wasn't there before. This is because many algorithms very intimately share some subroutines. And here I've given examples of two algorithms, uh, the Prim's algorithm for computing spanning trees and Dijkstra's algorithm for computing shortest paths. Uh, the pseudocode is basically copied from the uh, uh, Introduction to Algorithms textbook. And you can see that even though these two compute quite different things, on an input weighted graph, you can see that uh, actually there's a massive correspondence between different subroutines inside them. And in reality, there's only minuscule differences in how you manipulate the data if you have uh, these two algorithms side by side. So if you've meaningfully learned how to manipulate data for one of them, it should be quite possible to reuse some of the knowledge you've, uh, you've gained to learn to execute the other one much more easily. So basically, these manipulation representations can truly positively reinforce one another, leading to a sort of meta-representation of algorithms. And this gives us plentiful opportunity to do all sorts of multitask and related kinds of learning, such as meta-learning or continual learning. And we have the added benefit of, because we know the underlying algorithms and the links between subroutines, we have clearly defined task relations, which I believe is missing from a lot of standard meta-learning or continual learning data sets. So a lot more structural inductive biases that we can use to kind of further propel our models and our benchmarks. And I, I like to think of it also in the sense of there can be easier algorithms and harder algorithms. And once you learn how to model an easier algorithm perfectly, you can use its output as an input for something that's harder. So if you look at breadth-first search, which kind of learns how to do shortest path in an unweighted graph, uh, 
you can generalize some knowledge from breadth first search to learn how to do shortest path algorithms in more general graphs, such as Bellman, Ford, or Dijkstra. Because the reasoning is quite similar. The only difference is that now you have to accommodate for the fact that uh, some of these edges may have weights attached to them. So once you have the concept of multitask learning and representations of manipulations, it actually isn't a massive leap of faith to reach algorithmic discovery as, a, as an end game. Because if you have an algorithm that executor that stepwise simulates a particular algorithm, you can then inspect some of these intermediate outputs of the algorithm and as a result, decode the underlying behavior. And if you're able to make some reasoning about the decoded behavior, you could end up deriving novel algorithms. And in particular, I think two directions are going to be quite uh, exciting here. One is we could end up with more interesting heuristics for problems that are intractable, such as traveling salesmen. And here on the right-hand side, I have, just for visualization, one possible way to do traveling salesmen in Euclidean space, where you kind of uh, line up a particular tree, spanning tree of your data, and then you kind of take a walk on the spanning tree and you use that as your cycle. Um, and we could easily use some of these modified heuristics to come up with novel, uh, with novel and improved heuristics. But another area which could be quite exciting is that a lot of these algorithms as well as heuristics have been devised with uh, you know, a single threaded CPU machine in mind, which can only really focus on one node or one object at a time. However, GPUs and TPUs are what we use nowadays for executing neural networks and hence graph neural networks as well. And these have a very sweet benefit of being able to look at many nodes at the same time and make reasoning steps on all of them independently at once. And this can give us opportunities to devise novel, robust algorithms that could run on a GPU or a TPU and achieve much better, say, approximation bounds. And we can use the outputs of these uh, on neural net executors in order to get better at devising such algorithms, which I think could be also quite an exciting area for, uh, for application. And uh, in a way, because we're doing, uh, we're looking at sort of these input output mappings and we're reusing this previous manipulation knowledge, which is like all the algorithms you've been taught in the past, in a way, this is contextualizing competitive programming into machine learning. Because a competitive programmer looks at a new problem, a description of a problem, a bunch of input-output mappings uh, that it needs to model. And the competitive programmer is also armed with the knowledge of uh, all the other algorithms they have trained on in the past, so they can reuse some of the knowledge from there. And at least to me, this correspondence is quite exciting because I have used competitive programming as a way into computer science in general through solving tasks on platforms like Sphere Online Judge and Code Forces to like also participating in the ACM ICPC, where uh, on the right-hand side is a photo of my team actually winning the ACM regionals one year. So to me personally, this direction is quite exciting because of the links between the, between the two fields. And I think there's one conjecture that I have about how uh, these sort of uh, algorithm executors can help us discover at least novel heuristics in the sense that uh, we can start by training them on a huge amount of these efficient polynomial time algorithms. And when you look at, say, efficient search algorithms on graphs and polynomial time algorithms on graphs, there's actually not that many. There's maybe 20 to 30 algorithms. So it's not that infeasible to have a multitask learner that picks up on the manipulations on all of them. And then unleashing this network as a prior starting point to solve something that's MP hard or something that's much harder from uh, inputs to output mappings only. And what I hope a neural network will be able to do is this notion of soft subroutine reuse. It's going to be able to recombine pieces of knowledge from previous algorithms that are efficient, but recombine them in a way that makes it more efficient to reason for a much harder task, and therefore basically use this softness property of neural nets to explore the space of possible polynomial time heuristics in a much more efficient way than, say, a human would, because we can only see into so little of the of the combinatorial uh, uh, space of heuristics. So this is my thought on how we could use this eventually to end up with more efficient heuristics for really complicated problems. And uh, I will now completely switch gears and present three very recent pieces of work that have been used to kind of kickstart and set up the field at different scales. And it's quite exciting that uh, all three of these papers have came up basically 
practically concurrently and they explore completely different areas of the algorithmic reasoning setup and they all make basically very favorable conclusions. <clears throat> to start with, I will uh, start with an analogy which looks at different levels of uh, programming language complexity depending on the kinds of tasks you want to solve or the level of uh, operations you want to have control over. You can have high level languages like Python, which are scripting and often like many really complicated subroutines like, I don't know, computing and eigen decomposition of a matrix can be done with just a one liner in a language like Python. Then you have a language like C++, which gives you control over much more of the internals. And if you wanted to, you could also descend down to the pointer level and like the underlying machine level but it also allows supports for things like classes and constructs that you can use to more to streamline your program and make it a bit more readable. So it operates on this like middle level. And on the lowest possible level, you have languages such as uh, pure assembly or uh, even like binary machine code or uh, other sorts of <clears throat> simple Turing complete languages where you explicitly have to write out every single operation that the machine has to do. Uh, in its like native language. However, by doing so, you also have guarantees that your program will be as efficient as it possibly can get because you've hand designed every instruction to map to the underlying architecture. And in this correspondence, there are these three related papers, two of which have been published at uh, iClear just now, that operate on different levels of algorithmic execution. So we have uh, on the algorithmic level, the paper from, uh, paper from Kay Luxu and others, uh, what can your own let's reason about? On the step level, our own contribution to uh, iClear um, on neural execution of graph algorithms. And finally, at the unit level, this work from Google Brain on neural execution engines from Eugene Yan and others. Um, and all three of these explore algorithmic reasoning on different levels using graph neural networks. The algorithmic level paper, looks at learning an algorithm just end-to-end. -end. So input-output mapping without any additional supervision on the manipulations, and they focus more on the theory. They establish a theoretical link between parts of the neural network ar architecture and how it aligns to the underlying reasoning procedure and the generalization power that you can expect from this architecture. And they formalize this and prove a few theorems that are quite relevant. And most notably, they prove both empirically and theoretically that graph neural networks align really well with dynamic programming on which most polynomial time algorithms are basically propped up. So this is quite encouraging from a theoretical point of view that it makes sense to use GNNs to do these kinds of execution tasks. <clears throat> In our own step level contribution, we actually supervise on atomic steps of an algorithm. So we figure out what's a particular unit of um, of time that an algorithm uh, uh, executes through. And then we try to supervise on all the intermediate values it has access to. And we actually then push this idea forward and realize that when you do this atomic stepwise supervision, you can get much better at strongly generalizing and testing out of distribution, which is exactly what we do and we verify. And also at the step level, we can do multitask learning to kind of reuse knowledge from subroutines and we find that using this multitask learning plus neural network architectures that rely on maximization, you're going to get much better strong generalization. So it's also evidence that this subroutine reuse is a concept that is uh, potentially going to be quite useful in this space. And lastly, at the unit level, uh, these algorithmic executors actually only learn to execute very tiny operations. Like think of things like addition, argument, multiplication. So very trivial individual steps, which can still get quite complicated for neural nets to do. But they learn how to do them very strongly. And then they compose them in a particular way to reach uh, specific algorithms. And using tricks like binary encoding and conditional masking, which basically also hints that this architecture is also closest to the, the bare metal of the algorithm, they're actually able to achieve perfect strong generalization because these tiny components can be perfectly learned and then composing them can leave no particular harm on the underlying algorithmic performance. So it's also a good hint that if 100% accuracy is what you care about, it is also possible to achieve it using these kinds of methodologies at least. So I will start by briefly covering the first of the three papers. And it asks this generic question of which networks are best suited for certain types of reasoning. The theorem that they formalize and prove is that if 
your neural network has better structural alignment with the underlying uh, algorithm, that means that it will generalize better on the tasks modeled by this algorithm. And specifically, graph neural nets map really well to dynamic programming. Here they've given both a single example of mapping graph neural networks to the Bellman Ford algorithm for shortest paths, and at the bottom, a bit more generic expression of how different components of a graph neural network directly relate to the recombination and update rules that a dynamic programming algorithm might do, and hence why they are very well suited to modeling dynamic programming tasks. Uh, the architectures that they look at are first multilayer perceptrons that just take the concatenation of all the objects in the set and produce an output. So these kinds of structures, uh, they cannot really reason that well about the interactions between objects. They can only do really well at potentially extracting a particular feature of a particular object, so basically isolating a particular component of the input. This is something that they could do well. Uh, on the next level, we have a set-wise architecture like deep sets which uh, processes each object independently and then aggregates them together into a setwise representation to get the final result. These kinds of architectures, even though just like MLPs, they're universal approximators, they are going to be much more sample efficient at summary statistics tasks. So if I take a set of inputs and I ask what's the maximum, what's the average or something like that, deep sets can very easily compose these kinds of object level statistics into summary statistics. And then GNNs are a further step after that in that they explicitly model pairwise interactions between objects. So you take the hidden features of two nodes and you combine them using a relational MLP and then you sum up all of these interactions together you can uh, derive some answer on the graph level, which explicitly takes into account relational information. So say, if I want you to compute for me the, lo the longest distance between two points uh, in a set of points, deep sets could answer that question well. But if I want you to identify for me which were the two points that are furthest apart, here deep sets would struggle because they have to summarize the entire set. And as a result, they've lost track of which two objects actually had the longest distance. Whereas GNNs can explicitly encode for this in their relational reasoning, and they can more effectively isolate what are the two objects that contributed to a particular result. And I here put pairwise in brackets because there's also a notion of potentially hypergraphs with more than pairwise relations. But it turns out that in most cases, you can decompose, say, ternary relations into a bunch of binary relations and just stacking a bit more layers. So usually, pairwise relations are all you need to model arbitrary scale relations. And the results that they get on three differently constructed tasks largely highlight uh, these benefits. So if I ask you for summary statistics, so on, uh, in a set of a bunch of objects, like integers or real numbers, what is the maximum difference between two items? MLPs are going to drastically struggle at this. They get 9% accuracy, whereas deep sets are going to get quite good at modeling it, 87% accuracy, and GNNs are also quite good and quite competitive on this kind of problem. But then when I ask the argmax question, which is, which are the actual two furthest objects or some feature of them, like what are their colors? Deep sets will now suddenly get a huge challenge to disentangle all of these setwise relations and actually tell me what are the two objects that are furthest apart. So their performance will drop to about 20%, whereas GNNs, which are specialized to process relations, will still perform really, really well. <clears throat> and lastly, they ran this on a dynamic programming style competitive programming task which uh, forces you to figure out some sort of shortest path in a graph or a problem that's related to it. And once again, deep sets struggle quite badly on this and MLPs too. And GNNs, depending on how many steps you perform, uh, the actual DP algorithm requires seven steps. So the closer you get to seven steps, you're going to get better modeling performance. But already with only a few steps of message passing, you're able to get much better inductive biases than if you used a deep set style architecture. So hopefully this illustrates that GNNs are a good idea to modeling at least dynamic programming tasks. And most efficient polynomial time algorithms can be phrased as a form of dynamic programming. Now we will focus on actually learning to imitate the algorithm a bit more closely, which is what we've done in our iClear paper. So in this case, we are supervising on output values of an algorithm at every step of the way. 
So here on the left-hand side, you have an example of Bellman Ford algorithm for shortest paths, which at each step maintains this X value in each one of the nodes. And this X value tells you the current belief of how far away am I from the source vertex. And at each step, you will take the X values for all of the neighbors, combine them with the edge weight of going from the neighbor to the central node, which is just the edge, edge value from that node to you. And in one step of the algorithm, you're going to aggregate all of these options together by choosing the neighbor that gets you there the fastest. So you take the minimum possible value of x neighbor plus edge from neighbor to vertex. And on the right-hand side, you have computations performed by a standard graph neural network, like a message passing neural net, which uh, looks at latent features of the two nodes attached to an edge and potentially any edge features, and computes a vector-valued message using this message function m. So each node basically sends a vector-valued message to uh, its neighbor. And then a vertex aggregates all the messages uh, sent to it using some kind of permutation variant aggregator, which I've here denoted with this O+, plus, which uh, can be anything like summation, maximization, or something like that. And then it gets recombined using this readout function u. Usually, both m and u are just simple linear layers. And what we're doing here, because there's clearly strong alignment between what the message passing net is doing and what the algorithm is doing, is at each step, we're going to force these outputs of the readout function to be predictive of the knowledge the algorithm would have. So after k steps of a graph neural net that's designed to simulate shortest paths, I should be able to predict the k hop shortest path distance from each node to the source. So if I'm using no more than k edges, how far away can I get? Uh, how close can I get to the source? So this is the essence of, uh, of our algorithmic execution framework. And uh, the way in which we've conceptualized it is that for each algorithm, so it's a multitask setup, potentially, for each algorithm that we care about, we're going to have these very tiny encoder, decoder, and termination networks, which are just simple, usually just simple linear layers that are algorithm-specific. Algorithm and they're tasked with taking your inputs from the raw input space into the shared latent space, and also taking it back from the latent space to uh, the desirable output space. And the termination network is something like adaptive computation time in that it decides at each step whether or not to terminate using the graph level latent embedding. And the crux of the algorithm executor is the processor network P, which sits in the center and operates directly on the latent space executing the underlying algorithm. And this is the part that we actually model using a graph neural network, and it explicitly takes into account the edges. And we try a variety of architectures here for the shared component. And what we hypothesize is that because algorithms have complex manipulations, message passing neural nets are going to be the most generic and most useful style architecture. And because a lot of these dynamic programming algorithms require choosing, like searching for a particular neighbor or a small set of neighbors, so you have this inductive bias of needing to do a rigorous credit assignment. We find that probably maximization aggregators are going to perform the best because they directly encode for this bias of, I only want to select a handful of neighbors rather than aggregating all of them in some way. We evaluate uh, this uh, execution architecture on a variety of parallel and sequential problems. For parallel, we look at uh, reachability and shortest paths. What I mean by parallel is that all the nodes can get updated at the same time in one step. And then at the same time, we look at sequential algorithms, specifically the PRIMS algorithm for minimum spanning trees, which is sequential in the sense that it only adds one node at a time to the, uh, uh, to the resulting spanning tree. And we actually encode for this inductive bias explicitly. We learn a mask which uh, selects, using a softmax, a vertex to change at every point. And we only modify the outputs for that particular node. All the other nodes remain the same. And this inductive bias actually ends up being very useful for strong generalization. We generate uh, undirected graphs from a wide variety of distributions, both naturalistic and more regular. So things like Erdos Renyi, Barabazi Albert, but also grids and trees. And we attach random valued weights to each edge, which more or less guarantees that the solutions are going to be unique. And we study this human programmer perspective, where we train on fairly smallish graphs of 20 nodes or so to execute individual steps of these algorithms. And then we see how well the learned executor generalizes when the test graphs are much bigger, up to 50 or 100 nodes. And 
Critically, we learned to do these parallel algorithms, BFS and Bellman Ford, at the same time with the same processor network to see to what extent can we actually leverage subroutine reuse, because the breadth-first search can be thought of as the Bellman Ford algorithm uh, specialized for unweighted graphs. And the results that we get here, we train on 20 node graphs, and we look at a variety of processor networks and how they perform when modeling the shortest path uh, algorithm, Bellman Ford on uh, graphs of up to 100 nodes. And what we can see is that when we scale up the test graphs that are five times as big as the training graphs, as we predicted, the message passing neural net with the maximization aggregator emerges as the best option, which preserves the inductive biases the best. And actually, it stays at about 89% accuracy of reconstructing the shortest path tree, whereas most other architectures uh, by that point are catastrophically uh, losing performance. Um, critically, we also compare against the variant which only trains on shortest paths without this extra BFS objective. And it turns out that first, grounding the algorithm in reachability, which is very simple to do, is a good first step before you scale up the shortest paths because you're going to lose about seven percentage points of accuracy when you don't have the reachability objective, when you're just doing single task learning. And also, the Stepwise supervision is quite important because a variant which doesn't include supervising on individual steps, but just goes straight from input graph to shortest paths after a certain number of message passing steps, that one also loses about 10 percentage points of accuracy. So both the stepwise supervision and multitask learning are quite important for strong generalization, and maximization aggregators line up really well with this kind of reasoning. And the results largely carry over for sequential execution tasks. In, in particular, this inductive bias of uh, picking one node at a time and then deciding how to add it to the tree turns out to be quite beneficial. If you have the no algorithmic variant, which just goes straight from input to spanning tree without this bias of having to process it one node at a time, even if we give it a lot of computational credit, it's still, when it's, it's still reasonably okay-ish at the training distribution level. But when we test on graphs that are five times as big, it actually performs worse than even a non-graph baseline, an LSTM, which uh, doesn't take into account the graph features that well, but it actually has this bias of picking one node at a time. So this inductive bias is very helpful when we know that the algorithm actually proceeds uh, sequentially. And uh, finally, I will briefly touch upon the neural execution engines uh, framework which learns to simulate tiny operations at the unit level and actually can achieve 100% strong generalization. So what we're doing here is we're teaching a graph neural net to strongly perform very tiny tasks, such as summation, products, or arguments. And then we can compose them to specify most popular algorithms. This is still a fairly challenging task because these building blocks must stay robust when you give them very long or out of distribution rollouts. And they reuse a lot of ideas that sort of touch the bare metal, like assembly level ideas into their model. One idea which I thought was quite cool is that they encode all of their inputs using bitwise embeddings. So they don't represent scalars like we did in our paper. They actually have binary inputs for, um, for their individual objects. They use transformers as the, main, uh, as the main execution block in that they learn how to focus on a particular input, and then they learn how to process it to get a particular output using attention. And they also predict a mask at each step. This notion of conditional masking says that at each step, you model control flow by only looking at a certain subset of your inputs. So for example, if you want to do sorting algorithms, at each step, you could think of this transformer as isolating the smallest element and then updating the mask so that at the next level, you're not attending over that smallest element anymore. So you're kind of iteratively learning to extract one smallest element at a time. And uh, this you might recognize as exactly selection sort. So repeatedly composing the argument operator and masking out the element that you've just pulled out leads to exactly the selection sort algorithm. And it's their first motivating example for doing sequence to sequence modeling of sorting. And so at each step, their execution engine takes in the array and the mask that they have so far. And they take out the minimum element out of the unmasked elements. And they learn how to mask it again for the next step. And as a result, you will get sorted list of outputs. Um, and when they train on sequences of length eight, their variant of the transformer uh, 
is the best performing, but they're able to modify some vanilla transformers to also reach 99% accuracy. But the true differences come up when you try to scale up the trained model to sequences of up to 100 items. Transformers, the basic transformers seek to seek basically just lose expressive power sometimes very quickly when you scale up the input space. Whereas this neural execution engine idea of explicitly picking out and updating a mask remains at 100% throughout all input sizes. And at the bottom left corner of this uh, slide, you can see one reasoning for why this happens. When you try to scale up this seek to seek attention to longer scale sequences, the attention quickly gets quite fuzzy. After about processing the 30th element, the attention coefficients become very unclear and kind of uh, frozen. Whereas on the right-hand side, you can see the attention coefficients for the execution engine, and you can see that it very robustly learns to focus on individual elements, even as rollouts get very long, up to 100, uh, up to 100 steps. So this is one qualitative reason for why these architectures perform as well as they do. And then they proceed from there to see how these individual execution engines can be composed efficiently. To get Dijkstra's algorithm, you need to combine a summation engine with a minimization engine and then an argument engine at the end. And these three are kind of composed sequentially to iteratively export uh, shortest paths in a graph. And they also show that they can be composed recursively. So if they learn the merge operation within merge sort, which uh, looks at uh, two subarrays and pointers into those subarrays and learns how to iteratively merge them together into a sorted array, then they can recursively compose this uh, to learn the merge sort algorithm. And they found that both for selection sort, merge sort, and shortest paths, when they train on eight object inputs, and try to generalize to up to 100 element inputs, they get 100% strong generalization performance in all of these cases. So robustly learning tiny components is one way if you want to kind of guarantee the strength uh, of the execution. However, the problem is that they have to kind of bake in, at least in the architectures they have so far, they have to bake in the control flow of the algorithm by explicitly deciding the output of which engine gets fed into the input of which other engine. But other than that, it seems like a very robust and uh, promising direction forward at the more unit level uh, execution. So to conclude, algorithmic reasoning is a very exciting and novel area for graph representation learning, which uh, can support both benchmarking graph neural nets, uh, better strong generalization, potential for multitask learning, and eventually algorithmic discovery. And three works which came out more or less at the same time explore it at completely different levels, reaching very interesting conclusions at all these levels. So you have the algorithmic level approach of Kaluxu and others, the step level approach uh, uh, that was published by us, and the unit level approach that came from Google Brain, Eugene Yan, and others. And obviously, this is uh, this field is still at its uh, at its infancy. So many questions are still left to be answered at all the possible hierarchy levels. So I'm hoping that uh, this uh, motivates uh, people to potentially explore a little bit in this area and maybe contribute uh, in their own way. I would just like to conclude by thanking all the, all the great collaborators I've had with this work, Charles Blundell, Raya Hatzel, Rex Singh, Matilda Paravano, Lars Bu Singh, Matt Overland, Razvan Pashkanu, and Oriol Vignals. And yeah, if you have uh, any further questions, I would be very happy to answer. Thank you.